Hello, everyone, and good afternoon for the people on the right side of the ocean. Good morning for others, and good evening for even still others. Um, my name is Benjamin Piper, and I'm the Senior Director for Africa Education at RTI. And thanks so much for joining today's discussion on upper primary education. Um, many of you all know that there have been substantial investments and in activities in improving learning in lower primary. But this other area of upper primary has been left behind by donor funded interventions, as well as real focus on improving outcomes. So this means that millions of children in low and middle income countries are actually completing or getting towards the end of upper primary without the skills they need to do well in exams or to prepare themselves for, for their next levels of education. So the upper primary quandary is substantial because children enter upper primary transitioning out of what we hope is low, better quality lower primary, but they often enter into upper primary with various levels of proficiency skills across subject areas. And they're often learning in upper primary in a language that they haven't had as much academic exposure to. And this increases the burden and the challenge for uh, upper primary teachers. And to deal with this complexity requires high quality, evidence-driven upper primary interventions. And that's to say nothing of what has happened as a result of COVID-19 and the learning losses that several estimates have suggested are there for, for kids in upper primary. Next slide, please. So it's in this context that RTI has just published um, a few months ago, a new white paper uh, called Higher Grounds, Practical Guidelines for Forging Learning Pathways in Upper Primary Education. And I want you to see the pictures of the authors <laughs> particularly the ones on the, on the left side of your screen, very talented researchers who developed this white paper that has kind of five core components. Number one, in upper primary, how do you improve teaching quality through professional development tailored for this level? The second component is it's not just about the system, it's about pedagogy. How do we think about improving pedagogy for teachers in this upper primary subsector? Third, how do we think about assessment? not just assessment of learning, but assessment for learning. And as we'll talk about a little bit later, assessment as learning. How does upper primary deal with assessment? The fourth category or component of, of the work we, we worked on was teaching and learning materials in upper primary. How should they be designed? How is that different from, from other uh, portions of the system? And the fifth category that's really important is this, the social and emotional learning needs of children at this level. How does school climate in upper primary overact, over, interact? And, and finally, how do we prevent school-based and school-related gender-based violence that is unfortunately a major concern in many of the countries we, we, we care about? So let me talk to you about what's gonna happen in this webinar. First, we're going to hear from Patience Soa, my colleague, who's the first author of this uh, white paper, who's gonna give us an, an overview of the work. Um, and then she'll shortly then be joined by Wendy Rylangita and Rachel Jordan for a short Q&A on, on the white paper. So as Patience presents in a moment, be thinking about your questions, even if you haven't read the whole uh, white paper yet, um, we, we welcome your questions. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen in your toolbar so that we can get as many of the questions uh, answered during our panel discussion. So be putting those in. We'll be having, after a short presentation by Patience, some time on Q&A. So, so add those as we get going. You'll be muted uh, throughout the webinar, so please be communicating to us via the Q&A where you ask the questions you want to ask and then the chat feature whenever you have any other comments. I'm really excited and honored to be able to get to this point in the, in the webinar and hand off to Patience, who's going to walk us through. Patience. Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar. I'm going to um, start my presentation by first describing the upper primary child, because I think it's very important to describe the characteristics of these learners because it impacts the way they're taught and the way they learn. And then I'm going to give a brief overview of each of the components that Ben just mentioned. So we're starting with the upper primary child. They're at a both critical and exciting stage of development. They are undergoing physical, social, emotional, and cognitive, as well as metacognitive changes. Upper primary often marks the onset of puberty as well. 
And this is an exciting time for teaching these children because at this point in their lives, they're curious, they're creative, they are trying to figure themselves out, their identities and their role in this world. And teachers need to keep these characteristics of these children and tap into them in order to help them reach their full potential. These children are also very vulnerable. And this is an issue that teachers will need to address as well. They're vulnerable all over the world, but particularly in low and middle income countries. They face cultural, social, political, and economic challenges, which often prevent them from attending school and very often ultimately not completing upper primary. It is no wonder then that the World Bank noted with alarm that over 617 million children are not achieving minimum proficiency levels in reading and math at the end of primary. So this is why we're here today, to present our white paper, but also to advocate for the upper primary child, advocate that more focus should be given to them and to, to point out the need to keep the characteristics of these learners in mind um, as we teach them in schools. Next slide, please. To develop the white paper, we did some research in low and middle income countries, as well as the global north, to see what worked best for teaching and learning of the teaching and learning of children of this age. We came up with five essential components. Now you may look at them now and say, well, this is equally applicable to children in the early grades. And in a sense, they are. But also, as we've mentioned before, we want to take the unique characteristics of these children into consideration and then tailor teacher professional development to prepare and help these teachers hone their craft to effectively teach these learners. So I'm going to start, next slide please, with component one, which is fostering teacher quality. We recommend that teachers be taught to self-reflect, to be inclusive, and to pay particular attention to the developmental progressions of children because students come to upper primary at different skill levels and the teachers need to be able to have the appropriate tools to teach them, meet them where they are, and help them achieve mastery of the subject matters. We also recommend that teachers use developmentally appropriate pedagogy and assessments to inform practice. We delve deeper into what pre-service teachers needs, need as well. And we recommend that colleges of education, training colleges move away from a focus on theory to giving pre-service teachers more opportunities to enact high leverage practices. And these are core practices that they need um, to effect change in authentic classroom context. So we want to have school-based practical where they're in school teaching children. For in-service teachers, we recommend ongoing professional development. We recommend that these um, trainings or um, TPD be small, targeted, and staggered across the academic year. We recommend that they be hands-on and focus on how teachers can teach children increasingly abstract and complex subject matter. Next slide, please. Component two is a focus on numeracy, literacy, and the content area subjects. And here we asked ourselves, so what do teachers what should they know and what should they be able to do as they're teaching upper primary children? As in all teacher preparation and professional development, we recommend that teachers have strong pedagogical and pedagogical content knowledge. That is to say that teachers know how to teach 
as well as more specifically how to teach their subject matters and that they have a deep knowledge of developmental or learning progressions. In the area of numeracy, for example, we would like teachers to be able to build on foundational concepts that children have learned in, from the early grades. We would like them to be able to scaffold mathematical models and representation and to teach children how to explain and justify their answers. And most importantly, especially for me, not being a math person, make links to out of school mathematics to make math more relevant to the to the children they teach in literacy and language as ben mentioned earlier in upper primary and low and middle income countries we have a unique situation where children are moving from instruction which has totally been in mother tongue or local languages to instruction in english french portuguese as a language of teaching and learning. So these children are not only learning language, they're also learning literacy and content. And to teach children, these children, teachers need among others to be able to integrate the four language domains, that's oral language, listening and speaking, as well as reading, writing and viewing, which is a visual literacy. And because of their characteristics, we want teachers to be able to buy, uh, provide bilingual scaffolds for these students. And so we're saying it is okay to use mother tongue languages to help children understand the concepts that they are learning, as well as the variety of multimodal resources that children need at this stage in um, their schooling. Content area teachers will have two roles that is to teach their content and ensure that it's comprehensible to these language learners, as well as provide them with the academic language needed to grasp the content and to be able to demonstrate through oral language, reading and writing that they've understood what they're learning. Teacher professional development for content area teachers then will need to have hands-on approaches that, that we recommend that teachers actually do science um, rather than looking at the theory as well as social studies. Next slide, please. The third component and fourth one as well um, are, are high quality teaching and learning materials. And these include language supported textbooks. Since we know that these young children are language learners, we want to ensure that they have textbooks that are language supportive. That, that is to say textbooks which help scaffold content and language and literacy. We want, uh, we recommend these textbooks have, for example, bilingual glossaries, plenty of visuals, be, have simple grammar, very simple vocabulary. So there's no cognitive overload while children are reading them and trying to understand the concepts. We also recommend a lot of supplementary materials, both audio and visual, as well as manipulatives that they can use to learn math. Assessment is the key in all of this. They help teachers identify where children are on learning and developmental progression, and then help them take the steps they need to ensure that these children achieve mastery of the learning outcomes. So we recommend that assessment be integrated into instructional packages and that teachers be supported to learn how to interpret student work and use these findings to inter interpret their teaching. Next slide, please. Component five is our last component, but is, is certainly not the least. Um, we consider this component to be most essential and one of the most important because we believe that without positive school environments, it will be very difficult, very challenging to implement the other four components effectively. 
how can schools then ensure that they infuse social and emotional learning, that there are positive school climates, bearing the cultural context in mind and prevent forms of abuse like school related gender violence. We recommend that school communities be engaged in developing a shared vision of teaching and learning, that they engage stakeholders to prevent all forms of abuse, and that there is there are accountability systems to ensure that children are safe when they are in school so they can flourish. We also recommend that cell be integrated into the curriculum to help learners develop resilience and to help them develop the capacity to respond to changes in their lives. So these in a very quick nutshell are the five components that make up the um, white paper. We say a lot more and um, I hope it gives you a glimpse into the complexity of teaching um, in the upper primary grades, but also um, helps us to move forward as a community to advocate for these children to ensure that they can reach their full potential as learners. Thank you. And now I'll call on my co-authors and colleagues. Wendy, Rachel, and Ben to join me for any questions that you might have about our Q&A, uh, sorry, about our white paper. Thank you so much, Patience. Um, very exciting and thanks for the questions. Feel free to keep adding them in. Um, we'll be turning to our panel in just a minute, but for now we have a, a couple of questions. We'll, we'll add more as they come. So the first one, this one is fun. Okay, so for teachers who are accustomed to lecture methods in classrooms and aren't very confident in teaching particular subjects, it seems like this white paper is asking a lot. The teachers have to know the developmental progressions of each individual subject, know where their individual students are on that progression based on these new assessment metrics, help students develop social emotional skills, all while teaching in a language that students may not be quite as skilled in. How can you realistically expect programs to catalyze this level of behavior change through the kind of typical small scale professional development events throughout the year? So one of you guys gets to answer that one. Um, my mic's on, so why, um, why don't I take that on and try? Um, the, the questioner is right, it is complicated, but I think the key here is that professional development is ongoing, that we have a variety of professional development and that we take it step by step. In other words, we're not going to inundate teachers with, well, you have to do all these things, but step by step, take them through um, the, through their training, through professional learning communities to teach them just how to help children of this stage. So for me, it means a move away from the large thousand people trainings to more smaller school-based and cluster-based professional development opportunities. And if, for example, we are infusing how to teach cell as we're doing the teacher training, it then comes naturally. If we're teaching them um, about how to pose reading comprehension questions, for example, we want to ensure that some of these reading comprehension questions help build on um, student social and emotional learning skills, help build those skills. So that in short, um, Wendy, Rachel, anything else to add, Ben? I'd like to add on, you, I think at the end of the, the question, you said something around, you know, how can they do this through the smattering of short trainings across the year that we tend to see? And my simple answer to that is you can't. <laughs> there has to be a real investment in pre-service making sure that the whole teacher professional learning cycle is continuous throughout their career. Um, 
including including um, ongoing teacher support through you know some sort of coaching communities of practice etc and it and it takes time it's not going to happen in a year or maybe even you know four or five years it, it really isn't a, a long-term investment that needs to happen um and I mean, certainly starting with their with where teachers are and their ways to scaffold and start from where teachers are um, to eventually over time get them to, you know, the ideal place, but it does take time and investment. And also asking them what they need, because sometimes we make assumptions about what teachers need. And so, and then starting from there, they may not know all the time, but it is you know, good practice, I think, to ask them, well, what do you need? How can we help you be more effective? Thanks, Patience. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, another great question from Alisa. Hi, Alisa. Good to see your written word, even if not your face. Um, so she asks, I love the self-reflection aspect of teaching. So do you have strategies for how teachers who are not accustomed to doing this to be able to practice reflection, self-reflection? especially those teachers who are already grappling with their own social emotional learning and needs. How do we get teachers to, to ref, be reflective? Ben, I'll, I'll happily jump on that. Thanks, Alyssa, that is a great question. Um, I'll start by answering it as a former teacher and then I'll answer it as a researcher. Um, as a former teacher, I would buy myself a nice new journal every at the beginning of every year. And I said, every day, at the end of the school day, I'm going to sit down and just write down what went well and what didn't go well. And just by doing that, you know, it'll help me become a better teacher. And I would fill it out for the first two days of school, and then it would go on my desk drawer, and I would never touch it again. So I recognize that even in really resourced environments, this is hard. Um, putting on my researcher hat, I think we found, you know, it's a it's a it's an emerging field, but there's been a lot of investment and intention in teacher professional learning circles. So I think it starts there. You know, my experience also points to this. Teachers aren't going to do it on the, their own because there's so many competing demands. You need a venue in which this kind of reflective practice is facilitated through, you know, a learning circle coordinator, a mentor, a coach, or a head teacher. Um, and I think you made a really good point about teachers themselves, you know, having their own experiences as children in school, as teachers in school, they're kind of going through their own journey of reckoning um, their, their feelings about their school's culture and climate. Um, I think you start with giving teachers a choice of things that they might want to test out. Uh, and then they can, they can test out one new strategy and they can judge through their self-reflection whether or not it worked for them. And in that process, they can also reflect on maybe some more personal, emotional, you know, um, cultural dynamics of the classroom. But you start with just one specific small strategy. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. That makes it more doable. I appreciate it. Listen, there's a, there's a lot of good questions in the chat as well as in the Q&A. So for those of you who are seeing the ones in the chat, we'll put them in the Q&A so we can respond there. We're conscious of time, so we have a bunch of questions we're going to let, leave unanswered for now and keep it moving. What we're going to do next is we're going to talk and have some reflections on, on the white paper. So if we can go to the, the next slide so you can hear from our, our, our moderator. Um, you can just see that picture of her because it's a good one. Um, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Joni Cohen-Mitchell who is the Acting Deputy Director and in in Policy and Techn Technical Leadership Lead at USAID Center for Education, still getting used to that term. She has over 30 years experience working in international and community development, particularly in, in our beloved education sector. Her expertise includes many things, program management, design and development, m and &E system development, qualitative participatory approaches to development and evidence, evidence building, staff and organizational strengthening and capacity building. She has focused her work in the areas of basic ed, adult literacy, non-formal education, foundational skills, ECD, girls ed, and family and commu community engagement in uh, Latin America, Caribbean, Africa, as well as in the US. She has worked for a variety of implementers, foundations, for-profit institutions, and government organizations. She holds an MED in international education and an EDD uh, in an educational policy research and administration in the very well respected 
Center for International Education at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. So very much looking forward to your, your comments and thoughts on this topic. Tony, over to you. Thank you so much, Ben. I very much appreciate the opportunity. I'm excited to have this conversation with you all and everyone who's present today. So thank you so much for inviting me. As illustrated by the white paper authors, despite many investments in improving learning in primary education, millions of children in low and middle income countries are still completing upper primary without the necessary skills for further learning. USAID in particular has invested in foundational skills programming together with our country partners and implementers for over three decades. And together we have worked diligently on many aspects of what I like to call the education value chain, books and teaching learning materials, issues around language of instruction, training and capacity building, pre-service, in-service, systems reform, always laser focused on access, quality and equity. And while much attention has gone to the early primary years, as mentioned many times already, scant attention has been focused on the upper primary grades and what it needs to look like and be different in order to achieve meaningful learning outcomes. As we well know, foundational skills are the critical building blocks to achieving learning outcomes. And they matter because they empower students, children, young people to access additional knowledge and more experiences. So together, we need to fix our eyes firmly on this crucial goal and unite so that we can better understand what works in upper primary precisely because of the wider opportunities it will unlock for millions of learners, particularly those most marginalized. Higher Grounds offers practical approaches to supporting learners through the transition of lower primary school to upper primary, reminding us that it requires high quality evidence-based interventions. And as we are all so very well aware, the need for impactful intervention has only been exacerbated by COVID-19 as we struggle as a global community to stem the significant learning loss that has resulted from the pandemic. Some of the issues that um, I think deserve particular attention in the upper primary grades, excuse me, and that you will hear more about today from our speakers is the notion of what are the requisite foundational skills in literacy and reading. And this whole notion of moving from learning to read to reading to learn in content and subject areas. Numeracy, basic numeracy and higher level mathematical skills and their relationship to real world math. Focused attention on keeping girls in particular engaged in learning, keeping schools safe, and combating school-related gender-based violence for all students. Ensuring that all learners are considered issues related to equity and inclusion, inclusive education, UDL, learners with disabilities, refugees, and IDPs. Social emotional learning. And finally, teacher preparation, pre and in service, coaching, understanding teachers' own skills, as well as the skill needed for learner outcomes. And I wanna make mention of one comment that was made about how do you ask teachers to do all these things and pivot so significantly? And I wanna draw on my experience working with USAID over three decades on early grade reading and literacy programs. We didn't come to where we are all at once. It was a journey that we all took together, many of you who are on this webinar. And we learned as we went because we did research and we did inquiry and we started to crack the code a little bit. 
on books, on lessons, on teacher in service, on the need for coaching, on language of instruction issues. And I imagine and I foresee that we'll be doing the same thing in our quest to better understand upper primary. But enough from me. I'm going to facilitate one-on-one -on -one interviews with each of our three distinguished panelists who have spent much time thinking about these issues. So let me introduce them in the order of which they, I will interview them and then we'll get started. Okay, so first we have Dorothy Cassanda. Dorothy's impressive history in education extends over 30 years. Since 2007, she has served at CAMFED Zambia as head of programs, deputy executive director, director for partnerships, executive advisor, and in her current role as national director. Dorothy began her career in education, like many of us, as a teacher of English and French and head of languages in several Zambian high schools. Entering the field of management in Zambia's Ministry of Education, she rose through the ranks to senior education officer at ministry headquarters, where she was in charge of capacity building and was one of the four officers who spearheaded the restructuring of the Ministry of General Education to a decentralized structure. Additionally, Dorothy extended her experience into civil society, working at the Forum for African Women Educationalists of Zambia as program manager and national coordinator before joining CAMFED. Dorothy holds a master's degree in a business administration from the East and Southern African Management Institute a master's degree in education and numerous professional qualifications, including a graduate certificate in quality education from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Laketi Mekalela, excuse me, is a professor and founding director of the Hub for Multilingual Education and Literacies at the University of Witwatersrand, South Africa. He is a distinguished visiting professor at CINE University of New York. His research areas include translanguaging, multilingual education, and literacies. He is a B-rated researcher and a holder of the National Research Foundation Sarchal Chair on Advancing African Languages for Social Inclusion and Access. He pioneered a globally acclaimed theoretical model, Ubuntu Translanguaging, and its pedagogical equivalent, Ubuntu Translanguaging Pedagogy, to normalize simultaneous learning and teaching in more than one language in complex multilingual education systems. In addition to his highly influential book, Shifting Lenses, Multilanguaging Decolonization and Education in the Global South in 2021, brand new, I'm gonna go out and buy it for sure. He has produced four interrelated books on innovations in language and education. And finally, but not least, Kwame Atiampong is a professor of international education and development at Open University, United Kingdom. He has over 25 years of experience in education program evaluation, teacher education policy and education access and equity with a focus on disadvantaged and marginalized groups in sub-Saharan Africa. Kwame has produced education review and evaluation reports for various ministries of education and throughout Africa. He also served for two years as the senior policy analyst with the United Nations Education Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO's Global Monitoring Education Report in Paris. Kwame co-chairs the World Bank and the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office Global Education Evidence Advisory Panel. Following three interviews, 
Wendy Rowangita will open the door for Q&A with all of us. And I'm sure like me, you all will have so many questions for this incredibly distinguished panel. So I'm going to start with Dorothy. Dorothy, please join me on screen and welcome. Uh, Johnny, I think somebody needs to. Hello. Uh, somebody needs to put me on camera. Thank you there very you much. Are. You're Thank all you, Johnny. Wonderful. Hi. Welcome, Dorothy. I'm thrilled to get the opportunity to ask you a few questions. So let's get started so that we can allow time for all the Q and A's that I am sure is going to follow. Can you give us a few examples of policies and practices implemented by governments, donors, and implementers, which have successfully supported the education and protection of adolescent girls? What made these practices and policies successful, in your opinion, and who did they target? Thank you, Johnny. And first of all, allow me to, to thank the um, the organizers, RTI, for put, uh, including me on this panel discussion. Um, it's a real pleasure. Um, there are a number of um, white paper recommendations um, which firmly align with uh, our experience as comfort. And um, it was like the interdependence of uh, SEL, uh, school culture, and SRGBV. The need for SEL to be um, culturally rele relevant, the need to engage schools, communities, and families in SRGBV prevention, the uh, importance of clear systems of referral and accountability, all these are very important. And um, one area of discussion that uh, I'd like you to, to, to pay attention to is um, the extent to which delivery of SEL curriculum should sit with their teachers. Uh, the white paper recommends that teachers reflect upon their own experience at school in order to better connect with their learners, social and emotional well-being, and point to examples of teacher-led SEL and school related gender based violence curricula. Our experience in CAMPED, um, because we work with uh, poorly resourced um, and marginalized um, uh, school environments, um, we've found that uh, while teachers are very relevant and um, very uh, um, important in facilitating SEL and uh, bringing in a, a positive school uh, climate, they are not really best uh, placed to deliver SEL curriculum. And the reason is that um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in rural areas, there are very few role models, female teachers. And um, because they're focused in, in, uh, on uh, delivering the syllabi, the um, academic um, um, angle of the syllabi. They, they, they find it um, quite challenging to, to, to address some of these um, issues. So what we came up with was to um, develop um, a curriculum together with our partners, uh, Pearson, called My Better World, and using the um, alumni, the comfort alumni, the girls that uh, we support through school, uh, who are really peers with the children in the, in the schools where they are, in the communities where they are. They are the ones who are um, um, delivering the life skills program and um, uh, through My Better World and, um, and, and um, uh, the, 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 the Learner Guide program. And we found that uh, because they've lived this experience, they are, the children relate better with them and of mm. course, they are working with them um, under the supervision of teachers. Um, and they're working within the communities, uh, working with uh, not only the school, but they bring in the angle of community where they, um, they engage with uh, uh, traditional leaders. These um, G G GBV issues start from the communities and um, uh, filter into schools. And of course, they are um, 
they, 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 they are really bad for, for the children. But we need to tackle the root causes of, of, uh, of these vices. And therefore, it's important to engage the, um, the, school com the communities at school and the, um, the traditional rulers from, from the communities where the children um, uh, are based. Um, there are many um, policies that have uh, put, been put in place and uh, most of them, of course, emanate from the, they're anchored within the, um, the international, um, the international um, uh, policies, um, like the SD, S, SDGs, the, um, the job chain in the, in the 19, 1990s, uh, education for all. But of course, education for all cannot happen in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment which is not em enabling. And therefore, um, those countries that have signed up to these um, uh, policies and, and strategies, they come up with um, um, not lo locally um, uh, rooted uh, strategies. One of them is uh, the free basic education, uh, which, um, which, which, which has really uh, freed, freed up uh, a lot of children into engaging in school. The other one is uh, what we call the, um, the re-entry policy, which comes with um, um, ensuring that girls who are sexually abused and uh, they drop out of school and get fall pregnant, they can come back to school. And what we, we've done is to strengthen that, uh, is to work with uh, our partners the legal and the legal partners in the NGO world to ensure that um, uh, governments in the countries where we are um, are well placed to um, to to implement these. Uh, please tell me, John, you, so that I don't overshoot the. No, <laughs> the you, I, I think I'd like to ask one final question before we do need to wrap up because you've really highlighted quite a bit. You talked about some examples. You talked about the critical role that communities need to play. Hmm. And I think for our last piece, before we have to move on, um, I guess I'd be really interested. And from your point of view, what do you think donors and implementers should be thinking about around social emotional learning and the creation of positive school cultures and climates so that young and primary age school girls and boys are ready and equipped for all the challenges they face in adolescence? Well, donors play a, a critical role. Uh, first of all, the issue of um, ensuring that uh, the, uh, the policies and guidelines are really adhered to and uh, the implementing is taking place within the schools, within the, uh, the, the, the national programs. I think that's what, something that the donors can look out for, especially um, in, in terms of when, when, when uh, uh, governments are committing themselves to, um, to implementing uh, GB and GBV um, um, uh, strategies that those are embedded in the proposals that are, that are, that are, that are being um, uh, submitted and also to ensure that uh, these are locally, locally rooted because if you, you bring something foreign, then of course it will not work. It has to be owned by the people that are, that are implementing. So it's very important that th those um, angles are looked at from the, uh, the donor point of view. Yeah. Wonderful. Perfect. Thank you so much. I know others have many more questions that we'll get to in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Dorothy. I'm Thank now going to invite Lakete to put on his video so I can ask him a number of questions. Welcome. Thank you, Johnny. Yeah, thank you so much. I know many people have questions related to literacy and language, your area of speciality. Um, so I'm going to start with one and feel free to meander into other ideas. In terms of critical transitional grades of four and five regarding language and literacy learning, what points from the guide would you like to highlight when thinking about what ministries of education 
donors and implementers should do and should be thinking about to support learning. What recommendations do you have that might not be in the guide that you want to put forth? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, very critical of the transition, transitional literacy transition from lower to upper grade level that uh, there is this thing that I want uh, funders uh, to think about what you call the great four slump uh, or the Matthew effect that uh, from that age as they go into the upper primary um, the uh, children begin to the weaker those that are weaker are only getting weaker and weaker uh, throughout the education system therefore um, the big thinking then is we think about the sociolinguistic output, uh, what type of society. And the reason for that is because, you know, they're multilingual, they have got uh, uh, more than one language. And uh, we talk about maintenance, how can they maintain what they have rather than reducing uh, what they have. In other words, once your mother tongue is subtracted, through many of the immersion programs that are supported and sponsored. That is uh, equally to reducing a part of you and your identity is compromised throughout the whole education system. You begin to caution yourself. Uh, you have got two legs and then you're told that only one uh, should be used effectively. So the thinking should be around maintenance programs. How can you move into the new, if you learn through the medium of English, but how can you sustain uh, your home language as well? Because in your mind, you are wired with two already. As long as you know the other language, we cannot wish that away or try to subtract that away. It's creating identity crisis. This whole immersion program uh, is, is quite uh, devastating for many of these young people that are only imagining, you know, becoming uh, young adults very soon. So it's critically important for the donors to think about not immersion programs, but maintenance programs, because social mm. linguistic, you're not uh, producing someone who is going to be functionally operating only in one language. Uh, you want someone who can operate meaningfully in more than one. Wonderful, thank you. Let's stay on this topic for a while. I'd like us, well, I'm gonna ask you a question about materials, teaching learning materials. So what are some of your ideas in particular for implementers, donors, and governments to ensure the publication of quality language supportive teaching and learning materials to support the transition to the L2 or the language of teaching? Well, um, materials, uh, first of all, they need to be um, culturally appropriate material. There should be they, this whole idea of, um, you know, your identity, how do you see yourself within the material that has been developed? Um, it should be culturally uh, relevant. It should be age uh, appropriate. And then we see a lot of versioning of materials from one language to the other. And oftentimes I would love to see materials that are developed uh, um, from the communities. In other words, they resonate with the ethos of the people in this particular uh, uh, local spaces. But oftentimes the materials we have are produced in mass in big ways. And uh, because of that, um, they tend to be given. So we say more is better, uh, but oftentimes if the foundations around what we are giving in mass, in big numbers, is not grounded in the ethos of the people that are going to be uh, you know, receiving, uh, then the more can actually be such a bad thing. Uh, it, it washes them away instead of uh, them seeing themselves growing within the remit of who they are. The whole idea of identity is what should come uh, at, at, you know, at the top when we think about materials development and, uh, and reading in particular. 
Thank you. Yeah, I see the identity running through a lot of your responses. So now we're going to turn our attention um, to your thoughts about what are some of the critical things that need to change to ensure beginning teachers are qualified to help learners achieve learning outcomes in the upper primary grades, specifically around language and literacy learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's critically important for, for teachers to be trained so that they can work within the communities in which they're going to serve, becoming responsive to those communities and to the complexity of the number of languages that are uh, in within uh, our classrooms today. Uh, here we're speaking about didactically thinking uh, teachers we train teachers so that they can find their own solutions instead of uh, being recipient of, well, they should receive something from outside, but you do want a teacher who is so agile, who is so versatile, who can find their own solutions from their own uh, classroom. Something like you know, action-based research should be in a very reflective. In the beginning of the session, there was a talk about you know, reflexivity uh, that you should be able to reflect, should be able to find a solution, should be able to work it up uh, yourself, especially if you deal with all these complexities of children that are immigrants and they're bringing a whole, you know, potpourri of languages and cultures, then you do want a teacher who goes to the class to say, I am going to learn and uh, not to teach. So the whole epistemological mm -hmm. shift around the classroom environment being about learning both the teacher and the student are going in there to learn. And there isn't teaching that uh, should be at the top of our, our, our training. And, and I think it is in that training. I would also recommend that it's important for teachers that are going to go into multilingual spaces to learn through teacher education programs, at least two languages. Mm. I was just gonna ask you that. I mean, in addition to being a reflective practitioner, which I hear you advocating for, we need to be thinking about um, the teacher's own skills and, mm -hmm. and knowledge. So do you wanna talk, of, uh, this is our last question and love to get everything out of you we can. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the skills teachers need? Well, um, it's, it's a post uh, teaching world is, is far much more uh, beyond methods. <clears throat> you want um, teachers that, as I said, a didactically thinking teacher is a teacher who is thinking off the cuff. So we, uh, the skills that they need to get to learn are very much soft skills around how can I find my own solution? Uh, if I'm, you know, like in the, in the um, military battlefield, uh, you don't wait to be given an instruction when you are tied at the corner. You should be flexible, dynamic. And this is a soft skill that I think all um, uh, teachers need to, to, to get a set of skills. I mean, I, technology, digitization is one of them, obviously, but there's a whole lot more in terms of their uh, flexibility, fluidity. They're dealing with this whole complex, ambiguous classrooms that they cannot plan for. So you, you plan for the unplanned and you want to deal with the, um, uh, be comfortable with the chaos uh, in the classroom while you're striving to get some cohesion. So it's a very, very uh, hostile uh, classroom environment today that our teaching program, teacher education programs need to thoroughly prepare teachers that are agile, that are didactically thinking. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Laketi. I'm going to ask Kwame to join us now for our final interview before we turn it back to everyone for questions and answers. Kwame? Hello. There you are. Yes. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, so we're going to specifically talk about teacher education and professional development with you. So we're going to start with what, what, from your very deep experiences with teacher training and professional development, 
what recommendations from the guide would you want to highlight when designing a professional development program for teachers in upper primary grades? And tell us a little bit, how do they differ from professional development for teachers who are focusing on the lower primary grades? Thank you very much, Joni. And uh, first of all, let me uh, congratulate the team which has put together this, uh, I think, brilliant uh, uh, document because I think it has some very important uh, messages for us uh, for how we can improve uh, training of teachers in the upper primary level. I think it's important, uh, one of the key things that comes through the, the, the paper is just how important it is to make a distinction between uh, the needs of learners in upper primary and lower primary. I think that uh, one of the things that uh, is highlighted is, is for me, uh, first of all, to say that the, these teacher professional development programs uh, should deepen teachers' knowledge of the stages of adolescent uh, development, emphasizing the fact that the intellectual development of adolescent goes through several stages and requires appropriate pedagogical approaches to maximize their learning potential. Uh, and I think this is very important so that we make that distinction. In, in lower primary, we often uh, are providing more generalized pedagogical approaches. But as you move into the upper primary level, uh, we need to emphasize the, 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 the pedagogical content knowledge that are linked to specific subjects, uh, but also the, 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 the conceptual knowledge that uh, these subjects require. So strengthening those aspects are very, very important. I think one of the things that the, the report also emphasizes, which I, I think is a very important point, is that uh, assessment. Um, I, I think that um, we often do not place enough emphasis on that. And, and, and teachers to be effective have to be able to understand the learning needs of these children at that stage. So I think that the, 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 the instruments that help, help the teachers to really understand the different stages at which children are, as they, uh, these adolescents are, as they uh, uh, navigate upper primary level is very important. But finally, let me add an, a, a very important message that comes through this report. I think there was a question asked about all of these things that we want teachers to do and to learn and understand. And it can be overwhelming. You know, when I read the report, I thought, okay, you know, this is, this is quite a lot. But another aspect of the report, which I think is important that helps us to contextualize all of these messages is the emphasis on professional learning communities. In every context, learning has to be situated within the environment in which teachers are learning to, to practice. And there is knowledge that is generated through that context. So I think the emphasis on, on teachers in learning as part of a community at upper primary, upper primary needs to be emphasized. Uh, and, and it's not the case that we, we give these teachers these tools and we let them alone in their classrooms. I think the opportunity for them to, to confer, to reflect, to engage, to, to, to talk about this, the special needs that are coming from teaching at the primary level is very important. And I think that this is where a lot of these uh, uh, examples and uh, uh, recommendations can really bear fruit in, 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 uh, in, in, in what teachers do in their classrooms. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna circle back to something you mentioned um, around assessment, because I think it's the top of all of our minds much of the time. Mm. The guide makes several recommendations on how upper primary teachers can be supported to use assessment to inform instruction through materials, training, and ongoing support. Let me posit something to you, Kwame. <laughs> if you were given the opportunity to develop your own program and an unlimited budget to fund it, what strategies and supports for using assessment would you invest in and why? And what are the important things to focus money and resources on? Hmm. Now, that's a very, very good question. And uh, I'm glad you added if I, if I have all the resources <laughs> that I, <laughs> I can use to do this. I, I just think that uh, um, Assess, one of the things we have to help teachers to do is to provide them with the resources for, for, for assessment, for, for, for using assessment in, as part of their teaching. And so I would really invest in, in creating resources that can be 
uh, either access through a platform or through materials that teachers can readily access. We need to provide the teachers with a lot of these uh, assessments. That to me, pro provide them opportunity to profile how their students are learning, to document that, uh, and also to be able to provide that to the students themselves. So I think resource development, uh, material resources for assessment to diagnose students' learning difficulties, uh, especially at that stage, the students would have come sometimes with lacking in some of the foundational skills. You know, how do teachers uh, identify these uh, uh, areas where they lack? So I think resources that can teachers can readily access will provide a lot of them uh, uh, would be my first, uh, my first uh, uh, approach. The second thing is to, um, is to create opportunities also for, uh, provide teachers with, uh, uh, if like the kind of technology that either in the schools in which they work, where they can uh, 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 work together to access resources for, that others are using in their own school. So I would put a lot more emphasis on access to technology, uh, mm -hmm. uh, assessment materials, uh, you know, some schools within the country, outside the country, in various uh, 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 environments that teachers can readily access. Uh, we are in the 21st century, you know, teachers should be able to access good resources if it's either in the United States or it's in Europe or it's in some other part of Africa, you know, and create this community where teachers feel that they can get the, the resources they need uh, as and when they need it in their classrooms. These are the areas where I think I'll put, I'll put a lot of emphasis in providing these resources for teachers. Wonderful, thank you. So I have a final question for you before we open up for the Q&A. Mm -hmm. Thinking about the current practices mm -hmm. in the preparation of pre-service teachers and upper primary, what do you believe are the biggest things that need to change to ensure that beginning teachers are skilled enough to help learners achieve learning outcomes in the upper primary grades? Now, that, thank you. That's a very, very important question. M my experience in working teacher education and my critique of teacher education, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, is that it is too much focus at the college level. I think what needs to change is that we need to shift or create more opportunities and time for trainee teachers to learn to teach in real classrooms. And what I mean by that is that the curriculum for learning to teach should shift increasingly towards the environment of real classrooms. And that is when the teachers can be confronted with the challenges that they are going to face as they prepare to become teachers, uh, full-time teachers. So I think we need that shift. We, I don't think we have enough of that. I also think that we need to have a, a collaboration with experienced teachers. You know, we, we think of teacher preparation, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, as something that is done in one environment. And then once the teachers get into the schools, we forget everything about what uh, they need to do. And yet they are very experienced teachers who actually know how to do upper primary teaching very effectively. We should bring them into the pool of uh, our, our teacher uh, our trainees uh, to be able to, uh, teacher trainers to be able to provide that support because they also hold a store of knowledge that we often do not access. <laughs> and they have that sort of knowledge from their practice. So I would like to see a blurring of the boundaries between mm. how teachers are trained in the colleges, but also how they experience teaching in schools and bring that expertise together. And I think if we're able to do that, we will maximize the opportunities for teachers to learn to become very effective teachers at the upper primary level. Thank you. Thank you so much. Such interesting conversations and I feel incredibly privileged to have been engaging with each of you around topics related to upper primary. So thank you so much for your time and attention and good thinking with us. I'm gonna now turn it back to Wendy who is going to lead us in the final segment of our time together, which is a Q&A. And I'm inviting everyone to come back onto the screen so that they can engage with our audience. Thank you. So I think I need someone to allow me back on. I, I, I think I had the video on earlier when I wasn't supposed to. And so now I <laughs> have to so have someone help turn it on. Megan, can you, there we go. Thank you. Here you are. Okay, so let's, um, I'm gonna ask um, all of the panelists, uh, Kwame, Leketi, Dorothy, please 
join us on screen. We've got a number of uh, interesting questions that have come in, and so I'll, I'll sure only have time to choose a few. Um, one question that I'd like to start with, I think to some degree, um, we've all painted um, a picture of where we feel that the system and where teachers need to be to really be supporting oh, yeah. upper primary well. Um, at the same time, I think we've all talked about investments that can take a while to come to fruition. Changing the way pre-service works, for example, can really take some time. Um, at the same time, we know that currently there are many teachers who themselves may be weak in content knowledge. Maybe they're not as familiar with social emotional learning. Um, they may have themselves um, issues with either the first or second target language. So one of the questions that came, how can we help teachers who themselves may have um, you know, difficulty with some of the competencies to, um, to improve and I would say in the shorter term, you know, we've talked about some long term investments, but sort of how do we get started and how can we help um, teachers who are teaching in upper primary who themselves um, may have some weaknesses. And this is a question for for all the panelists, I'm sure have ideas. So anyone who wants to is welcome to, to jump in and, and um, share some ideas, including Joni. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can share uh, uh, something we, we did uh, in Ghana many years ago when uh, we found that a lot of the teachers who were coming into training actually had weak subject content knowledge. And uh, even though they had qualified to, for, to come for the training, there were, very, there were big gaps in their knowledge um, and which we realized as when they moved to teaching upper primary where they were struggling with some of the conceptual ideas about teaching. So what we did was to identify some of the core areas where we, we, we've seen, uh, we've noticed these gaps and introduced these as remedial programs within the teacher education uh, program. So we are being more responsive to these needs right at the training stages. So uh, in each subject, it's mathematics, it's uh, English, whatever subject, we identify some core areas that teachers particularly struggle with uh, and have weak knowledge content. And then we, we, we included that in their program. So I think we need to start very early, uh, understand what the areas where teachers have these weaknesses and, and, and tackle them at, this, at the stage at this, when they come in for their training. And of course, uh, continue once they enter into schools and use professional learning communities to, to develop, to, to address those challenges as well. Thank you. Do other panelists wanna um, share ideas? Uh, Jimmy, can, I, can I just comment on that? I think it's, it's a very important uh, issue to discuss. What, what, what happened in Zambia is that um, um, the entry point into training colleges and university was lower for um, primary school teachers. But um, I think the policymakers realized very, 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 very quite late in, in, the, um, in, in the years that uh, the, we needed to have entry requirements for all uh, education levels standardized. And that's what, what has happened now. So the entry level for primary school is as, as stringent as that of um, a secondary school teachers for ECE, ECE, DE, and, um, and, and, and all the other qualifications. So that is helping to, um, to, 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 to improve the, uh, the standard of teaching. Um, for those teachers who are already in the system, uh, there is a, 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 a systematic um, professional uh, uh, development um, sessions that are held within within the schools and within the districts. So that's one way of uh, that that they've, they've dealt with that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to make one comment um, based on my experience working at the community college level in the United States that I wonder whether we should look towards that model a little bit, or, um, particularly as it relates to access and equity. And in community colleges in the United States, there's often some remedial light classes that everyone engages in or many people do to get them up to speed so that they can then move on with their college career. And it just makes me wonder if there's something in that model 
that we could scale up and afford, obviously, that we might learn from in order to really make sure that equity, ec access and equity is respected. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So the next question I think um, builds off, uh, there's a couple questions that are kind of related to assessment that came up. And um, Kwame, you talked a little bit uh, about assessment just now. I'd like to bring the focus to what we do with the information from the assessment. Uh, there was a question about um, remediation um, in upper primary and particularly recognizing that, you know, even in early grades, you have children in a classroom who may be at different levels. Well, as we move into upper primary, those levels may, those gaps between levels in a classroom may be even bigger from children who are coming in maybe without even foundational schools skills up to children who may be performing at grade or higher. And so one of the questions was around how to help teachers. What can teachers do? What should teachers be doing in, in a upper primary classroom that has those, might have those wide range of levels and, um, you know, what, what can they do both in terms of assessment, but then also using the information from assessments to help children at their levels? Mm -hmm. What I, I should say, what can they do and how can we support the teachers to do those things? No, I think that's, that's very important. I, th I think that uh, in, in, implied in, uh, in, with this, qu in this question is also the fact that we the teachers need to know the levels at which children, uh, these uh, 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 children are coming in and when they enter say grade four, uh, um, so being able to uh, provide them, like I said in, in, in my presentation, to, to, uh, with tools that can help them to identify the different levels at which children, uh, these students are, is very important. Uh, I, I think th that will help the teacher to be able to target the instruction to these different learning needs. I, uh, I, this is often something that we emphasize at lower primary, but we don't do enough at upper primary, that there are differences and the different stages at which these uh, students are. And, and the first of all, the teacher needs to know that and needs uh, assessment tools that they can readily use to identify the learning needs. But I think moving on there, I think assessment should become really part and parcel of the way we, the teachers themselves teach and use to really engage in the students to learn. Uh, and I think we don't often emphasize that enough. We don't want assessment to become another, another uh, you know, uh, a level of uh, activity that is so separate from what teachers do, uh, but rather make it an integral part of what they do. So some of the activities that teachers give students themselves, the worksheets, the, the books that they use should have embedded in it in these uh, 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 activities that provide information, not only for the teacher, but also for the learner to be able to understand at what level they have reached and where they're moving to. I don't think we provide enough signposting in our assessment uh, regimes in the classroom for the teacher and the learner to know where they are and where they're moving to. And I think more of that should be done as to provide these uh, guides for the teachers to be able to achieve these goals. Thank you. Any other comments on that question? I'll move on to a related question um, about assessment, which is in many places, there may be like a high stakes exam at the end of the cycle or at the end of the year that teachers have to grapple with. Um, and so given that they, you know, if teachers are able to find a way to give appropriate support to children at different levels in their classroom, um, uh, how, what do you think about how, what, what can be done about the fact that they're also grappling with these potentially high stakes exams at the end of the cycle, at the end of the year? I would also, um, as we move into upper, upper grades, sometimes the, the language in this, the, in which these exams are being given may be starting to shift as well. And the, the you know, students may be grappling with, with uh, learning in a new language. Um, so what are your thoughts about, uh, how teachers can deal with this situation or what needs to be done. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I should go agree, but uh, I, I can give my, my other panelists. Uh, but but let, let me let me let me just add that I, I think the reality is that as, as as the students get into the upper primary level, the the pressure on teachers 
to teach to the test, to prepare them for the exam, get stronger. That's a, that's the reality that teachers face. And, 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 and I think that it can be an advantage or disadvantage. If the tests themselves are good tests, teachers can use them as part of their instructional practice. So it's the quality of those assessments, those summative assessments are very important. Uh, and I think we shouldn't lose sight of that, that teachers would respond to those demands. Uh, but I think the way in which we can help them to use that also as part of their teaching and learning process is something that we haven't paid enough attention to. You know, how do you integrate these high stakeholder assessments into the regime of teaching and learning in ways which leverage on formative assessment ways? I think we don't do enough, we separate these, these two. And I think we need to see, yes, teachers have this responsibility, but what is it about these tests that teachers can use uh, in their own instructional practice to, to promote formative assessment uh, so that there's much more reflection on learning? Uh, uh, unfortunately, we, we, we separate the two and we do not bring, uh, uh, and we try to, to you know, move teachers away. So let's do more formative assessment. Uh, and, and when the teachers know that this, they have to really get these students uh, ready for these uh, summative or end of year assessments or, or, or transition uh, uh, exams. So I think we need to be realistic about the demands of teachers, but help them to, 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 to use this uh, to promote uh, better assessment practices in their classrooms. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Johnny, just, just a, a, a small comment there. Um, I do agree uh, with, uh, with Kwame's um, um, submission. But in, in places where uh, classroom accommodation is limited, um, <laughs> the um, summative exams are some, sometimes used to push out, push, push children out of the system. Um, and so um, I think the, the, the push should be to have um, uh, enough infrastructure so that there's accommodation enough for, for all the children and not push, push them out of the school system. Um, which is what really was um, for us um, the, the use of summative assessment. Um, but now the uh, continuous assessment, classroom assessment has been put as a policy um, because I think now the, um, we have enough uh, space for, 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 for the children that transition to, to grade eight. But at Kwame's point, the, the um, summative uh, assessment data should be used to, um, for, the, for the benefit of the children um, in remedial learning, in um, ensuring that uh, every child is at, uh, at the same level in terms of learning or, or even better level in terms of learning. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, I can agree more uh, that uh, there has been, although in terms of policies, uh, formative assessment is a requirement oftentimes uh, is a lip service. There isn't much happening. They are not able to feed back into the curriculum usually because the stringent uh, week by week uh, plans that whatever that you learn, you have no opportunity in the curriculum to implement that. So our curriculum tend to go broader instead of going into depth. So um, I guess that's the challenge and that's, there's a need for a push for more uh, formative and even low stake type of assessments if they were to inform uh, teaching and learning. Okay, one, one other question I had that, that um, relates to some of these issues around where we are now versus where we would like to be eventually. So I, um, you know, in one of my previous answers, I said, well, you you know, in, in response to the question of how can you do this in the current, you know, approach of having a bunch of, uh, you know, a smattering of, of trainings, and I said you can't, but given where we are, where do we start? So we, we in the paper, as well as among the panelists today, we've talked about a number of different areas that are important to support. We've talked about really good visions of, of where we feel that teachers need to be in order to support well in upper primary and some of the ways to support that, shifting pre-service, some of the in-service kinds of things we can do. Um, so I was just wondering, um, how do we get started? <laughs> so if, you know, if we have a certain amount of money to support changes, 
where do we start? Do we have some idea of where to start with investments and, and you know, how to build up over time? You know, where do we go from here, I guess? And I, I would love to hear ideas from all of the panelists on that. I mean, I, I would say, I mean, um, I've always felt that teacher preparation, the initial teacher preparation has not been given enough uh, attention as far as the upper primary level is concerned. I mean, we've unfortunately or fortunately had this emphasis on literacy and English at a lower grade, so which has taken a lot of our uh, attention. And, and more almost assume that once children get or the students get into upper primary, uh, they then sail through. And I think uh, my fellow panelists have made it very clear that there are challenges there with, with language, with understanding and uh, stuff like that. So I think that we need to start at uh, the principles that are in this, this document, I think uh, are refreshing and new, some of them, but I think we need to go back to the training and identify uh, in any system, the areas where we think some of these principles can be embedded in what is already there. Uh, because the, 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 you, we do an evaluation of those teacher education systems. Where is it, uh, is, uh, where's the emphasis when it comes to upper primary? Where are the gaps? And I think there are areas where this, this document would speak to uh, and we can strengthen some of these uh, 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 training uh, 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 programs and use some of these principles to, to, to emphasize that training. I mean, the point about tr transition from uh, in, in, in some countries, the early uh, grades you, you teach in the mother tongue. Now, once you move into that part, you switch to, to, to English. And, and it's almost assumed that this switch just comes on just like that. You know, all of a sudden the students are, have to, deal with it. And I think we need to look at how training prepares uh, 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 teachers to help students to make that transition. And there's a lot of uh, uh, good uh, 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 suggestions in the material, in the document that, has been, that can guide that to happen. So I would say that let's go back to the teacher training, teacher preparation stage, and, and use this document to be able to, as a, uh, if you like, as a, uh, as a, as a mechanism to, to look at where we need to strengthen these areas. Uh, and ensure that uh, uh, the preparation really is, 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 is strong enough and is equitable enough. Uh, uh, this is where I would start uh, with many of these recommendations in the document. I would start uh, with- maybe, maybe. Oh. please go ahead. <laughs> I was saying, well, uh, from a literacy point of view, uh, because of this transitional issue, if they sink um, as they make the transition, it's very hard to, to recover. So I would, if I have funding to uh, train uh, experts on transitional literacy and how to work with uh, multilingual um, children with uh, a number of languages, how can you maintain that even as you make the uh, transition into learning through the medium of English, how could you? So you need to have first transitional literacy experts, teachers that are experts in doing that type of work. Because I think if we are not able to resolve this transitional uh, uh, issue um, in the language terms from that age onwards, then there's some kind of uh, fossilization. So they, it, it gets harder if they're not attended to at that time and the, the, the performance throughout the system can really be um, quite a challenge. I, for me, I think the, the transitional literacy expertise uh, would be my first beginning point. Hi, Wendy. Uh, the issue of language for me is, uh, is key, um, especially looking at, um, at our, our position here. Um, we have uh, 73, 73 languages, and um, seven of those are, are embedded in the curriculum. And um, it, even though English is the official language, there is the transition between um, the lower grades into, into upper grades is, is, is quite distressful for the children, not only for the children, but also for, for the teachers, because um, much as they've been prepared, children have been prepared to get into 
uh, into English transition or break into, into English, they, they, they are not competent enough to understand the, the English that is in the, in the literature that is being uh, uh, used. And um, I think it's, 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 it's key to invest in that area. That transition period is very key in, in uh, ensuring that the children um, get the, the, the highest level of achievement. And, and so it requires um, good training for teachers, as already pointed out by uh, uh, other panelists. The transitioning, because what happens is uh, the teachers themselves switch, start switching from, uh, from the local language into English, and it's, it becomes quite confusing for the children. So um, both training for the teachers, the, the, the correct learning and teaching materials, which are appropriate, for the um, for the children, um, and and locally developed because uh, you find that uh, if it's uh, a, a, a textbook that is that's written and it reflects other cultures, children get confused and they start looking up for um, <laughs> for, for for a place. Just to give an example, just a place like um, something that is that is in another country, and um, they are looking it up in the dictionary. Um, so I, I think the development of the correct teaching and learning materials, the training of teachers, and the, the training should be um, in the colleges. They should be in the, the books and uh, the, the tools that uh, they're going to use in the classroom. Otherwise, they'll be de 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 detached from the reality. Thank you. Thanks, Joni. Um, I guess you have the last word in terms of <laughs> where yeah. we should get started. Thank Briefly. you, Wendy. Yeah, I I couldn't uh, help but echo everything that my colleagues have said, and I would add one piece about we know teachers are the fulcrum of change, but we know they live in an ecosystem, and I think we have to look really carefully at that ecosystem so teachers are not atomized, or the training materials are not atomized, or the assessment is not atomized, and that we really look up and down and across of that, what I like to call the education value chain and figure out how do we create behavior change on the multiple levels so that teachers can learn the skills they need and that students then can engage in you know, meaningful learning for learning outcomes. So thank you very much. Um, thank you all so much. Um, so we're, we're out of time. Um, but I really appreciate that there was a lot of great questions. We couldn't get through them all, but I, uh, this is just an indication that we need to continue discussing this really important area and, and look at uh, how we can expand investments and in support into the, into the upper grades to have children graduating from those grades um, with, with the necessary skills to succeed. Um, I want to thank Joni, Dorothy, Lachetti, and Kwame for joining us today and sharing your rich experiences, expertise, as well as Ben, Patience, and Rachel, um, uh, co-authoring for co-authoring the paper, as well as your, your contributions today, and the RTI comms team who helped organize this session. Um, as you can see here, this is the, the QR uh, code for the white paper. You can uh, use your phone to have that take you directly to where that paper is online. Um, you will be um, getting a short feedback survey on your webinar window after, after, this, um, after we close this session. So please take a moment to fill that out. And you'll also will be emailing you with a link to access a recording of the session um, in the next week or so if you would like to um, relive this interesting event. Thank you all for taking your time and joining us today um, for starting this discussion that we look forward to continuing. Please be well and have a good afternoon, rest of your day or rest of your evening as the case may be. Thank you.